I am firstly sorry to say I did choose that intro music, so. Hello, uh, welcome, good crowd. Thank you very much for coming. So, uh, who's still using Angular 1 at the moment? Sweet, came to the right talk. So, uh, basically in this talk we're gonna um, look at Angular 2 stuff and then sort of look at how we can go back and start getting our applications in 1.5 or lesser versions into a shape where we can actually start upgrading or get them to a state where upgrading is much, much easier. So if you want to uh, ping me on Twitter afterwards, that's my Twitter handle. Questions, feedback, there's no forms. So at the moment, I work at a company called Telerik. Um, we're doing a project called NG Migrate, if anyone's seen this. So this is a, a project that I've kick-started with kind of porting Angular 1 ideas across to Angular 2. So you can Google NG Migrate and uh, see what we're working on. Um, it's, a, it's a huge work in progress. So a friend, uh, Mike, he said that he'll be watching this talk because it's, the upgrade path is real. He's in America, so I don't actually think he's watching this talk. But yes, the, the upgrade path is real, and this is the whole, the whole basis of this talk. So this is the end goal, like whether it's in the next few months, the next year, the next two years, is that one day Angular 1 will be gone. Like it might be five years, 10 years, it could be two months. We, we have no idea. Um, it's completely community-based and how long we, we're kind of interested in it. So we want to go from dot component to at component and we want to understand the benefits of why we're going to go this way. So to do this in this talk is what we're actually going to go the other way around. So we're going to go from at component, because we all, we've all probably done a little bit of Angular 2, and then go backwards and show you some cool stuff with dot component, which is the Angular 1.5. So what we like about Angular 2 is the component architecture. It's moving away from like views and like uh, these big templates with um, like tons of ng repeats and all this different, different logic inside, which makes it much more difficult to sort of reason with. We also have stateless and, well, stateful and stateless components. So we're going to look at these in this talk and actually look at how we can apply these to Angular 2 and how we can backport them to 1. One-way data flow, like React uh, made this very popular. So Angular 2 now loves one-way data flow. So we're going to look at some of this. And the lifecycle hooks for Angular 2 tie in very nicely to one-way data flow. They can help us manage uh, the state of our applications. So this is a simple diagram. I'll blow it up a little bit. So this is a very, very simple example of how some kind of data flow would work. So the green box is a service. It has like an HTTP request of some kind. It doesn't matter what. doesn't matter the framework or, or whichever. So we, we essentially get some data, and we pass it down into a single component. So this single component then has child components, and these illustrate that we have further child components, and the arrows are simply the data that's, that's flowing down. So the idea here is that we just have some data at the top, and it trickles down. It falls into all of our components. Now, when we want to update things is when we introduce something called events. So the data flows down, and the events then get passed up. So this is how we can do this, uh, and we'll demonstrate this in, in Angular 2. So I have, I have to be careful which one's Angular 1. That one's Angular 1. No, 2. Cool. So this is um, my hideous chat application. This is more functional than uh, stylish. So the idea here is that we've just got some kind of basic component that manages a couple of different roles. And we'll actually walk through the code base here and look at lifecycle hooks, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing uh, we have is the ability to sort of change these. And you can see that the status here is changing. We've got the array of values, which is just an array of objects. And you can see I can start typing here, and there's no gasps that we're using two-way binding. So there should be, there should be. So we're going we're gonna to look at a better way to do this kind of stuff. So onto the code. We'll essentially, I've got about five different components, maybe six, a real basic one. Keep going forever. There we go. So we have like a, an app component. This then simply just renders out this chat element. So hopefully everyone can see that. 
So this chat element, it could be part of a, an entire view or an entire component which was made up of different components. It could be a completely new view on its own. It could be a rooted component that is past data. But for this demo, we're just hard coding it in the page. We're not passing it data via a root or anything like that. So what is inside this chat element or the chat component? So this is what we have. We have a base element. And if you've heard the terms stateful, stateless, dumb, smart, presentational, container components, they're all kind of the same words for the same things. So we're going to talk through how to sort of think about stateful and stateless components uh, using these examples, and then go back and do the exact same thing in Angular 1. So obviously, I'm pretty sure by now that most of us know how to create a component in Angular 2. So we do add component, we create a selector, we can add a template URL, for example. Now, the lifecycle hook part is where we can actually tie into particular phases of the component lifecycle. So this one on init is one that's very simple. It runs on the actual initialization of the component. So this is where we're using ng on init to go and fetch some data. This is a, uh, a service that I've written, which is completely static. It just returns some objects and some, some data that we can actually display. They shouldn't have put glasses down there. Um, Cool. Then we've got some functions, uh, which we then can, can learn about how we can actually build stateless components. So before we talk further about stateful and stateless, let's try and figure out what a stateful component is. So at the minute, I've got this base chat component, and I've, I want to hold all of my data inside it. So I don't want to sort of render five more components, and then each of them manage their own data. So if you think of this as a huge container at the top, wherever you place this component, it manages all the data for the specific roles, even if we have different components, such as this piece here, which is a completely different component. The data for this is being driven from the container, so everything is passed down. So the pieces that we want to look at uh, is my beautiful templates. So the first thing to notice here, I'll sort of scroll down a little bit so you can see that. This is the template for the, uh, the chat component. So it, it's, it's kind of different if you're coming from an Angular 1. Like years ago, I, I used to build like apps with a 1,000 lines of HTML in one page, and just it was, it was a mess. Um, and we, we kind of evolve into thinking about components. So the idea behind these stateful components is that they, they manage child components. So these, this is simply the template for the stateful component. And we're going to class these as stateless. So they don't actually go and fetch state. They don't, don't go and fetch data. But we pass it data. They can change stuff and then pass it back. So all we've got in the template is literally three elements, chat profile. We've got the chat filter, which allows us to change the status. And we've got the chat list. So this is where we're actually going to be focusing on uh, during this talk is actually understanding like the data flow and what we can do inside of here. And there's a couple of little tips as well that we're throwing in at the end. So one interesting thing, I've actually put an H3 here with chats. And I'm basically logging out the entire array. So the reason behind this, you can see it's this up here. This is where my, my parent component, the stateful component, is basically having the data. It's taking the data and passing it down. So when we actually. When we actually start typing, things start updating in the parent, which isn't such a good idea. And this is, this is Angular 2, so this is not Angular 1, where you expect two-way bindings to, to go all over the place. So inside the chat list, we literally have an input and then an output, if I can highlight. So the input here is the data, and the output is then some manipulated data or something that we want to tell the parent. So we have an input here called chats, and we have an output called select. Now, when we actually look at this, we have the input called chats, which we use uh, square brackets. And then select is going to be the output. And an output should ideally be a function that we use an event emitter. We can expect an event object back, um, which will then pass it back up to the child, uh, pass it back up to the parent component. And we could do something like, if I change somebody's username, like I was typing, we can then communicate with a service all in one place, so we don't have different components managing different states uh, elsewhere. So if we actually go inside the chat list, so this is something that I like to use, like the repeats, um, just for like a, 
actually rendering DOM nodes. So all I'm doing here is just rendering uh, with ng4, we use an li, and we just simply print out a list. Now, I can use a component inside that list, and I can just pass it the details of this particular chat. So each of these has another component, which I can pass in the individual chat. And when something changes, like when I change the username, it then updates here as well. So this allows us to like manage this. And if it wasn't inside an ng4 or an ng repeat in Angular 1, we can actually use that component elsewhere without a repeat. So that's, that's the, one of the benefits of, of this approach. So if we go inside of here, we have, again, a chat as an input and an update as an output. So at the moment, we've got three levels here. We've got the, the chat as the, the high level container. Then we've got the chat list and then the chat conversation. So we've got three levels. If something changes in the chat conversation here, we don't want to communicate with the service because the parent's not going to know about it or other components might not know about it. And it becomes, managing state becomes more difficult. So the idea here is we create an event and we simply just, when something changes, we just call this this.update and we simply emit an event up. So that is exactly what is happening here or will be happening here. Um, so one thing I'm going to show you is this is like, I've only got like, this is a really short talk, so I'm trying to cram it all in. Um, so we, we've got like these container components, we've got the stateless components, and you can see in these that they're not actually, we're not actually talking to any data. We're not, we, we, you, you can add functions in here to manipulate stuff inside, but this is kind of like a, the way I think about these is like a pure function. So if you, if you have a, a pure JavaScript function, you have an input, and given the same input, it will give you the same output. And if we think about components like this as well, the input would be perhaps like a function argument. And inside that function, we can mutate the, the data or whatever the function is actually doing. And once we're ready, we can use a return statement and just return data from the function. So this is how I think about components. It's just a function, but it's really HTML mindset as a function. So one really, really nice thing, um, this is obviously the Angular 2 app. And Two-way binding is kind of unpredictable at times, and it's not that great. So one thing that we've got is this ng on changes. So ng on changes is really, really interesting, and it's probably like the most interesting lifecycle hook um, for now. So what essentially ng on changes does, before the actual component is actually mounted, it's ready, it will actually synchronize like the data and the bindings. So this chat as an expected input will then be bound, and then the component is mounted. So this is the flow of it. So this runs just before the component is ready, which means we can actually do something beforehand. In this case, I'm going to check if the changes.chat is available. I don't wanna, don't wanna throw an error. It's probably gonna be available as it's an input. And if so, I'm gonna take this changes hash, I'm gonna reference the chat again, and I'm just gonna grab the current value. Now, I'm using object assign here, so I'm gonna actually basically take a clone and just merge a new, and create a new object here, and then bind it to this dot chat. So what this allows me to do, given that my webpack is hopefully not broken, is start typing like this stuff, and you see it doesn't update the parent. Everyone's just, what? So this is a good thing, because this allows my objects to be completely managed and self-contained. Like I can do anything to those objects, and when I want to change them, I can tell the parent. So before we can actually uh, get the round trip working, where, forgive me, I forget what the files are. Not that one, not that one, this one. So before we can actually get it working and kind of mirror this, this idea of two-way binding, uh, don't read this yet, I'll, we'll go through it in a minute. Recompile, there we go. So once I start typing, we have this update button which I can then click, and that's then updated the parent. So this is, this is a local way to manage your state and then tell the parent when something needs to change. So this is like an example of one-way data flow, how to tie things in with the lifecycle hooks. And the idea of this is to keep things like in immutable operations. So we're not actually mutating the objects directly, and we can go back and reference a particular object. So in this case, we've got this handle user update function which gets passed all the way up from, 
Uh, where is it? That one. So we emit an event from the chat conversation, which then goes up to the chat list. We then get the updated user object. This component then emits another event, which goes back to the parent. And then inside of here, all this handle user update does is just get called. So the actual function gets passed down in here. We expect the event, and then inside chat list, we do the same. So we're just passing functions down and passing data up. So that flow is pretty simple. And all we're doing here, instead of actually mutating, because if, if this was a to-do app, for example, we might do this dot to dos dot push, and you push a new to-do into the array. Now that's a, like a mutable method, and we could do something similar here. However, this is like an uh, immutable operation. Uh, is anybody using Redux or ng Redux or uh, ngrx store? These kind of things. A few people. So. One of the good things about this approach is when we start to think about using something like Redux is if we were to rely on two-way data binding, we would get all these automatic synchronizations, which aren't really that predictable. They're not that testable. Whereas we can basically abstract this, this piece here that I've highlighted into a, what we call a reducer in Redux. So we can take all these like, local state manipulation out and put them in one place. And that makes it very, very simple to just copy paste, bang it in somewhere else, and we're done. So now we've got this. Let me sort out my files. We have the exact same thing in Angular 1. So let me flick across. I promise you this one is an Angular 1 app. So here we go. This is the Angular 1 app. We've got uh, ng app up here. We've got the components, blah, blah, blah. So again, we've got this two-way binding. We love this in Angular 1. We can start typing, et cetera. So what can we do to basically get our code base to do all those cool stuff in, in Angular 2? And I've got two and a half minutes, so we're going to do it. Uh, right, so the reason uh, before we start Classes are not hoisted in ES6, so I need to put them at the top. You can put them in a different folder if you like. I've just kept them in the same because it kind of, it's, it's a bit more like Angular 2. If you imagine I had this right at the top here, it kind of looks like an Angular 2. Like if you imagine the top bit was at component, we have the, we don't obviously create the selector here, but we just reference the template and we say the controller is going to be this one. And the controller can just be an ES6 class. Now, we looked at ng on init in Angular 2. We now have dollar on init in Angular 1.5. So this is exact same patterns, the exact same code, just converted back. And this took like 10 minutes to convert the Angular 2 back to Angular 1. So it would take you 10 minutes to convert the Angular 1 to Angular 2. And the building blocks of a main application are the components and the data flow, like how you handle and abstract data, data layers and services. Uh, is, is completely up to you. But the, the upgrade for this piece would be far, far easier. So let's uh, get rid of that one. What I will do, Atom's a bit of a pain at doing all this stuff. Brilliant. Chat list component, and then, so I'm just trying to put them left and right. There we go. So basically, we can, we can look at what we want to do. The, the left-hand side is Angular 2. The, left -hand side, uh, the right-hand side is Angular 1. So from a binding template perspective, they look pretty simple. Like, if I wanted to, I could change this to an NG4 in a few keystrokes. I can add the little bindings. We're halfway there. The only difference really is that we use this controller as namespace in Angular 1, so we just add dollar control. If I delete that, that entire line looks the same. I can upgrade this piece, bang, done. So this makes the, the upgrade process a lot easier. Uh, let me show you some other things. So we've also got the chat conversation. There we go. And on this side, we'll open the Angular 2 one, yes. Cool. So this is the Angular 2 one on the left, Angular 1 on the right. Now we have this uh, ng on changes where we do this if statement and we clone the data. Now we also have this in Angular 1. So we have the dollar on changes. So this is the exact same way that Angular 2 works. 
Now we can use this.chat equals object to sign changes.chat.current value. And you can see all of my code is basically the same. One of the interesting parts, we got this.update.emit. This is telling uh, Angular 2 that we want an event emitter to broadcast up. What I do in Angular 1 is create this dollar event object instead, and you can basically just use that. And changing one to the other isn't like a huge deal. Uh, let me uncomment one more thing, and then we'll end up for the end of the session. So we've got this component flow, all, this, all the same thing, all the same bindings um, in Angular 1. So where we had at input and stuff in Angular 2, when we have an input, we use this syntax, which is the left arrow. So that's, that signifies one-way data flow. This signifies the, the callback like, as an output. So this would be a function passed in. So I've uncommented this piece, so we should be able to go back here. And then there you go. So that does the exact same thing um, in Angular 2. And that is pretty much my talk. If you want to come and ask loads of questions, then please do. Uh, but thank you for listening. That was, that was enjoyable. Thank you, Todd.